Welcome to Talking Hope, breakthrough conversations about preventing, treating, and curing cancer. Brought to you by City of Hope, an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center. Hope lives here in Orange County. All right, so hello and welcome to Talking Hope. My name is Darren Godden, and today our guest is Dr. Jeffrey Yoshida. Dr. Yoshida, you're the director of urologic surgery at City of Hope, Orange County. And I understand that you're a pioneer in robotic surgery, having performed more than 3,000 surgeries. Is that correct? Yeah, I stopped counting a while ago. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a tremendous number for this stage in your career. That's um, you're 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 amazing. Well, I, I owe a lot of that to um, you know City of Hope and getting into robotics really before robotics took off. Um, um, so, so being part of, of City of Hope back in the early 2000s, I mean, we, we really just, um, I think we were one of the pioneers on the West Coast for that surgery, for the uh, robotic prostatectomy. So yeah, a lot of credit goes to the institution. Well, we're glad to have you have you with us as part of that. So uh, before we jump into talking about your specialty and so forth, um, you know, a lot of people talk about how cool Dr. Yoshida is, and I think that's because you're a Orange County boy right now, and you're a surfer. So talk about what you like to do outside of outside of being a doctor. Um, I just take advantage of living in a great area. Um, I mean, I was just talking to another doctor before this podcast started, and he was talking about doing a staycation. He's not going to go anywhere on his time off, and it's just a great area we live. And uh, I love to surf, and there's great surf here, and uh, really lucky. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You got any favorite spots? Living. Spending time with the family, that's uh, time well spent. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any favorite spots you'd like to surf? Um, pretty much anywhere in Orange County, Huntington, Newport, Dana Point, uh, San Clemente, all great spots. I mean, we're just so blessed to have, you know, warm water most of the time, great waves. Awesome. Well, yeah. that's uh, hopefully you have a great summer out there on the water. So um, the focus of our interview today and our discussion is going to be around uh, prostate cancer. So I'm wondering what drew you to medicine and caring for patients with cancer? Um, you know, my my story uh, as it relates to going into oncology, I, I, I'll have to admit, I, I never really planned on oncology when I was in residency. Um, I knew I needed to, to do um, extra training and laparoscopic surgery because that was kind of really the, um, the field that was really expanding at the time. And so I decided to, to do a fellowship at City of Hope. And um, we uh, purchased one of the very first surgical robots, Da Vinci robots uh, on the Western United States about a week before my fellowship started. And um, fast forward a year, we were the highest volume robotic surgery center in the country and, and um, arguably top two or three in the world. And mm -hmm. so, you know, majority of those surgeries were, were prostate cancer patients. And so um, I had just had so much experience in, in treating prostate cancer patients. It just became kind of a natural field to, to continue on in. So I, I feel like it chose me. I didn't really choose it. And I feel very blessed to um, be in the position I'm at. Yeah. Great. Um, so let's, let's, let's dive into prostate cancer and can you tell us, um, what do men really need to know about prostate cancer first off? Well, I think, I think, um, you know, the, the, I, what, what I hear from, from, from men talking in the community is that the prostate cancer is not a big deal. It's slow growing. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, you're going to die with it and I die of it. And there's, there's, um, that, that's a, those are a lot of misconceptions, you know, prostate cancer is responsible for 30 to 35,000 deaths a year in this country. That's not a small number. Um, and also with prostate cancer, it's, um, there's a lot of pain and suffering and, but it's a very preventable disease. And so, you know, the screening that we do saves lives. Um, and that's really important. I think um, how we screen has, has improved leaps and bounds in just the last few years. I think there's a lot of stigma behind prostate cancer screening and the, the, the biopsy process and, and the false positive um, uh, issues related to the PSA test and so forth. And we've really come up with some new strategies new biopsy strategies that are much more precise and, and patients 
Uh, we use an anesthetic so they don't feel it. Um, we've also eliminated or reduced the false positive rates associated with the PSA test because we have uh, better screening tools. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that I think, um, you know, hopefully men can get, get past those stigmas because it's, ver it's very much improved, but it could be a lifesaver. Um, you know, prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers in men. And, uh, you know, if you get screened and uh, if you're one of the unlucky ones that gets diagnosed with it, likely we will catch it early and we can cure you and it can prevent all that future pain and suffering. So that's great. That's yeah. great news. So I, I understand it's like one in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. So obviously um, it affects a lot of us. So walk me through this. I'm a 40 something year old man. Um, what signs and symptoms should I be looking for or considering? Um, and then, you know, if I have those signs and symptoms, what is my next step? What should I do? Well, there are, there are no reliable, there are no reliable signs and symptoms of prostate cancer. Um, if a man has symptoms related to prostate cancer, likely it's a very advanced form. Hmm. Um, so the, the majority of patients, um, that, that are diagnosed with prostate cancer, they don't have symptoms. Now there's, you know, enlarged prostate symptoms um, also start affecting men in their 50s and 60s and that's in 70s and that's when prostate cancer is diagnosed. So I think there's, there's some confusion about enlarged prostate symptoms and those related to prostate cancer, but, but truthfully, there's really not a lot of symptoms to rely on. So for a 47 year old, it, you know, we would, we would um, make recommendations on screening based on your risk profile, right? So at-risk patients should probably get, um, should start their screening at an earlier age. So an at-risk individual would be someone who has a family history, your brother, your father. So if, if, if your brother or father have prostate cancer, your risk of developing cancer is higher than one out of seven. Hmm. If you're African-American, you're already at risk your risk is higher than one out of seven. In fact, if you're an African-American plus a family member, boy, your, your, your risk is really high. So, so focusing on at-risk patients, you know, probably around 45 or 50, for patients who don't have that family history or are not of that at-risk ethnicity, you know, um, having the discussion with your physician about the pros and cons and, and maybe starting that around age 55. There aren't, there aren't you know, universally accepted guidelines, but I think, I think that's kind of the most common recommendation. Okay. Yeah. And then, so, yeah. Go, so, so you, you mentioned um, screening then if, if there's no reliable signs and symptoms and screening is going to be important. So the age at which you start that screening might be important depending on your risk profile. Um, you mentioned a PSA earlier. Can you tell us what that PSA is? What is PSA and what is a PSA test? Sure. So, so PSA is, is kind of the main screening tool we use in this country and actually around the world as well. And it stands for prostate specific antigen. That's medical terminology for a protein that we can measure in the bloodstream. And the majority of that PSA or that protein comes from the prostate. Um, so we, we can measure that in the, in the bloodstream. And if, if a level comes back, at a, um, at, a, at a higher level, that, then that would trigger maybe some additional testing. Um, we also recommend the, the prostate examination, uh, which is also called the digital rectal exam. That's the exam of the, of the prostate with the finger. So that's the, that plus the PSA is, is what we use to initially screen the male. Okay, and you also mentioned maybe some other tools that are available now with screening. Yeah, so so the, the problem with the PSA test, and, and this is well known, is it's a nonspecific test, but we're using it for a specific purpose. So we're using it really only to screen for prostate cancer, but there's many other factors in addition to prostate cancer that can drive that level up. So when a man's PSA is higher, um, that's, you know, which one of the, the factors on the list, is it cancer, is it not? So we have newer tests that help look into that further. So historically, men have had biopsies or it was recommended men have biopsies when a PSA hits a certain level. That number has changed over the years. It's been around four, but that number has gone down to three in some instances. But the problem is if you just use the PSA and you biopsy men just from that level, 
there's a high likelihood that you could do an unnecessary biopsy. And that's what men are afraid of. That's one of the statements I mentioned earlier. So we have other additional tests that are non-invasive. We have uh, urine-based tests, other blood tests. We have imaging like an MRI. And we would do that first and, and do a, a real complete, much more accurate, non-invasive risk assessment. And if a lot of these tests look okay, it's likely that you don't have cancer and then a biopsy is not necessary. Hmm. But you, that's, so the PSA, I look at that as kind of an entry level screening tool that gets patients to us. Um, and then we, then we go from there, but, but gone are the days when we're saying, oh, your PSA is at this level, you need a biopsy. We always try to do this additional testing. Gotcha, thank you for that. Um, how is robotic surgery changing prostate cancer treatment? Well, you know, robotic surgery has been around a while. Um, so r- really the big, the big um, change between the, the traditional surgery and the robotic approach is that just men recover um, much more quickly. And so, you know, with the traditional surgery, men were in the hospital for a few days. They were you know, not returning to normal activities or work for several weeks, sometimes even not even returning to sports or working out for a couple months. Now with robotics, we're sending patients home the same day of surgery. Um, men are back to work in a week and a half, two weeks, back to exercising and, and most, most activities within two to three weeks. So it's really just, you're back on your feet, you're back to normal life. And then the side effects of treatment um, improved quite a bit with the robotic technology. The, the main two side effects of, of the prostate cancer surgery, radical prostatectomy is leakage of urine and, and sexual dysfunction. And with the all the advantages of the robotic approach, we've really um, improved those side effects. So, so um, we can preserve uh, men's ability to control their urine, their, preserve their sexual function much more often than with the older approach. Great. And what other options are there to men besides surgery? Uh, how does medical oncology and radiation oncology play into this? Yeah, so that, that's for, for a man diagnosed with prostate cancer, the, the, um, the most difficult decision that I've seen in, in patients is making the decision of should they do surgery? Should they do some of these other things that you mentioned, radiation therapy? Uh, there's even some patients where we don't need to treat depending on the cancer, it's it's a it's a observation protocol called active surveillance, and there's even um, newer treatments called focal therapies, and 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 really, basically, it's it's I think for a patient having, you know, kind of a team approach with experts that 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 know those different entities, those different types of treatments, and then having a patient, um, you know, have a detailed discussion with all these these different experts um, and, 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 and having that team help a patient make that decision. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of information that goes into that decision. Um, and I think meeting with, um, like we do here at City of Hope, when, it, when a patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, they'll meet with myself, I'll discuss surgery. That's my thing, I'm a surgical oncologist. And then immediately following that, they'll meet with the radiation oncologist to get information on that. And then sometimes we'll even pull in a medical oncologist where if, if the cancer might be more advanced or much more aggressive, we, we might even um, um, adopt some, some, uh, some therapies uh, that the medical oncologist would be involved with. But it's really this team approach and, and, and it's really being able to get patient the information, the information they need to make that difficult decision. Um, so, so that's, it's a tricky one, but, but that's, um, that's what we do here at City of Hope is that team approach. Uh, I love that. And <clears throat> obviously as a man, I, I'm glad there are options <clears throat> and I'm glad that we have options for our patients here at City of Hope, that there is a team approach and you do have options to choose from. Mm-hmm. Um, l- let me ask you another question about um, maintaining prostate health and preventing prostate cancer in the first place. So what can men do right now that helps improve their prostate health, maintain their prostate health? What can we be doing to um, to do that? I, I don't know about maintaining prostate health necessarily, um, but I think I think there are some lifestyle changes that a man can adopt that might reduce their risk of developing prostate cancer. 
I mean, um, there's been multiple lifestyle studies looking at, you know, many, many different factors. You know, being a non-smoker is really important. Um, exercising regularly, and we're talking, you know, three hours per week, that has been shown. Um, being of a, a normal weight, normal body build, in other words, not being overweight, we use something called the body mass index and we have certain parameters, but, but not being overweight or obese is really key. And then there's dietary things, you know, um, more of a Mediterranean or vegetarian kind of diet where you're, you're not consuming red meats, high fats, um, green leafy vegetables called cruciferous vegetables, that spinach, kale, broccoli, having daily servings in your diet. Um, those are all things that a man can do that, that, that could reduce the risk a little bit. Unfortunately, um, you know, if somebody's got a, a genetic predisposition, doing all that might not make any difference at all. Hmm. But, but I think if, you, if you're trying to control what you can control, those are things that are important. Great. Thanks for, thanks for sharing those. So what is your um, rooftop message, if you will, the shout it from a rooftop message that you would say to men listening to this podcast today about uh, prostate cancer? Yeah, I, I just think that the, the stigma around prostate cancer screening and also treatment, um, we've, we've changed, the technology has significantly changed and eliminate some of those those negative, you know, um, um, ideas that, that, you know, some of those negative factors that men, men think about, we've, mm -hmm. we've eliminated that. So I think screening is, is really important. It could save your life. It could prevent a lot of pain and suffering later on in life. And, you know, the way we do um, the screening here at City of Hope, um, we, we really aim to, you know, minimize uh, invasive testing, we use the latest technology and it's a team approach. So um, that was a long-winded answer <laughs> rooftop message, but, um, but do the screening and, and we do it differently. And, and, um, and um, I, I think we've eliminated a lot of the negative uh, negativity surrounding that, so. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yoshida, you've given a lot of men hope and not just men, but their families and their wives and their partners and so forth. So um, let me ask you this question before we come to a close. What does hope mean to you? What does the concept of hope mean to you? What is the concept of hope? I mean, it's, it's, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it when I, when I hear the word hope or the, the term, I'm thinking about city of hope. Uh, that's what comes to mind. And, and, you know, when we, and, and the reason I'm here is, is the culture that this institution has and, and, and what we give to patients when we first meet them and as we take them through the whole treatment process or diagnostic process or whatever. And so it's, um, it's a very caring, um, individualized and, and, and um, you know, really high-end team approach. So it's, that's what I think about when I think of hope. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm a city of hope, you know, doctor. And, and when I hear the name, that, that word, that's what I think of. So no, that's, that's, that's awesome. We, we appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Yoshida. We know you're very busy and we appreciate your time to talk with our patients and those listeners. Um, and thanks for talking hope with us today. So for the rest of you, we hope you'll join us on our next episode of Talking Hope. Until next time, I'm Darren Godden. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all for listening to Talking Hope, where breakthrough conversations about preventing, treating, and curing cancer have been brought to you by City of Hope, an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center. This is the hope you've been waiting for. For more information, visit cityofhope.org forward slash OC, or make an appointment at any of City of Hope's five Orange County locations, including City of Hope Orange County Lennar Foundation Cancer Center, the most advanced cancer treatment center in Orange County. Call 888-333-4673. That's 888-333-HOPE. -E.